Okay, we we'll return to John chapter 12. Uh, be in prayer also for the Tuesday night Bible studies. Which I try to teach that. It's the uh, first time I've really studied it in that aspect and definitely the first time I've ever taught it. So it's new for me as well. But we're with John chapter 12. Uh, I kind of had this thought on my mind for a while, but the Lord led me a little different as I was studying than I thought it would go. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 32. Here Christ is speaking and he says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard of, out of the law how, that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up, who is the Son of Man? I like our kind of think about who is the Son of Man today. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity and privilege we have to worship with that people today, Lord. I pray that you would be with us now as we look into that word, to bless the preaching of your word, that saints will be edified, that the name of Christ will be lifted up, that thou be glorified. And we do pray for Brother Larry to bless these there in North Carolina to give him a safe journey on his way back. We pray to bless all the efforts of the church, Lord. And we might see souls saved through those efforts. We thank you for Christ and his sacrifice for saving my soul, Lord, for your goodness and faithfulness toward us. And it's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. Yeah. Well, here Christ, he's concluding a discourse here to the, the people. Verse 29, he says, The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it and said that it thundered. You know, he was, God himself had spoken, saying that he had glorified his son. Some people heard it thunder. Some people said the voice from heaven spoke to him. Yeah. But here in verse 32, where we pick up, he says, That if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. There's some debate on what all men means here. Mm. Well, the Armenian says that God is drawing all and it's just up for man to respond to that drawing. But the word draw here literally means to drag. Mm. Uh, mm. Thayer's lexicon finds it as to draw by an inward power. Really it's a drawing of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? What we sometimes refer to as the effectual call. The Holy Spirit comes and speaks to you. Certainly he gives a, a general call, if you will, to all to repent. You know, he said multiple times, I'm saying to you, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Yeah. And God commands all men everywhere to repent. The book of Acts says. Mm -hmm. so the command does go out to all, but it only is made effectual to some, isn't it? Certainly this is the drawing of the, the Holy Spirit works in us today. We said, if I be lifted up from the earth, speaking of his crucifixion, verse 33, that John clarifies this, this he said, signifying what death he should die. Now he has, as we'll see, used this term before in several places about the Son of Man be lifted, being lifted up. He says, if he is lifted up, is he crucified, he will draw all men to himself. You know, all men could be all types of men. And that's one way to look at it, uh, that he draws of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And certainly he does. He tells us that in several places, the book of Revelation over and over uses that phrasing of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So 1 Corinthians 15 and 22 tells us, and then Adam all died, when Christ all shall be made alive. I certainly don't think any of us would say that that means every human never living 
ever have lived, ever shall live, will be saved, you know. Right. That, this is the same all that we're speaking of here. All men, or all types of men, and certainly to all of his elect. That's a, another topic, though, so we'll go on from that. Verse 34, though, says, The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how saith thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Mm -hmm. Well, they said, Well, Christ is supposed to live forever. And the, new, the Bible does teach that Christ lives forever. But Christ had to die as well, didn't he? Right. Revelation chapter 1 tells us he, he described himself as he which was alive and was dead and is alive forevermore. So Christ, I guess the people here couldn't understand that though he would die, yet he should live forever. So they said, well, who is this son of man then? Is he the Christ? Basically, they're asking who would. If we turn back to Daniel for a moment, Daniel chapter 7, this is the first and really the only instance I can find of, in the Old Testament of the phrase Son of Man being used to describe Christ. It's used, I think, over 80 times in the New Testament to describe him. Even Christ himself uses it most of the time. We, some, we often call him Son of God, but he's also the Son of Man. He's fully God and fully man, isn't he? But Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14 says, and I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, and languages, look, there's that same phrasing again, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. <laughs> So the Son of Man was to have a kingdom that was everlasting. A kingdom that shall not be destroyed here. It says, yet Christ was saying the Son of Man was going to be lifted up, was going to be crucified. To logical thinking, that's contradictory, isn't it? But the wisdom of God is not according to the wisdom of man, is it? The man thinks that you know, God has to do it His way. It has to be within His understanding. Yeah. But yet God is far outside of understanding, isn't He? If anyone thinks they figured out God, then they haven't figured out much about Him at all. You know, I don't profess to be a theologian or a Bible scholar or anything, but yet it seems the more you study about God, the find out the deeper and more magnificent He is. Right. And so it is with Christ. The Son of Man, they said, who is the Son of Man? The Bible, we'll look here in a minute in Matthew, tells us quite a bit about who the Son of Man is. Like I said, there's over 80 references to him. We definitely can't go to all those today, but I'd like to look at a few. Certainly, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the Lord, Christ, Messiah, uh, Emmanuel, and of course Jesus are many of the titles of Christ. But we'll look at the Son of Man in particular today. Uh, let's go over to Matthew. Well, before we turn to Matthew, let's look real quick at verse 35 and read Christ's response to him. It says, Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you, for he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Christ didn't really answer them directly, did he? He didn't say, I, I am the Son of Man, even though throughout his ministry he declared himself to be the Son of Man. He said, look to the light. Basically he was saying to look to him for the answer. Romans 8, 12, Jesus said he, he is the light of the world. Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light. You know, they had the Son of Man right there before them. They couldn't even understand who he was. And so it is most don't 
understand who the Son of Man is today. Most don't understand who the biblical Jesus is. Or they think of him as some long haired looking fellow you see in pictures or possibly hanging on a crucifix. They think of him as some tolerant, all loving, overlooking everything type of God. That's not the Jesus of the Bible, is it? Certainly he is loving, certainly he is compassionate, certainly he is merciful and gracious. But he does not turn a blind eye to sin, but certainly he does forgive sin. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. This is the first mention in the New Testament as far as starting from Matthew going through of the phrase Son of Man in reference to Christ. Matthew 8, 20, probably a familiar scripture. I know I preached from Luke's version of this recently. It says, And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. The Son of Man was not rich materialistically, was he? And yet there are so many today following a false Christ who they think is going to give them all their heart's desires. The problem is their heart desires are lustful and wicked, aren't they? Well, he'll give us their heart's desires when they're right before him. And certainly Christ could, if he wanted to, give us all the riches of this world. He blessed Solomon greatly, materialistically speaking, but yet we find over and over again that Christ himself didn't have much, did he? Christ it says here he didn't have a place to lay his head. It says that he rode in to Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey. It says that he borrowed an upper room to take the Last Supper. Christ didn't have much materialism. He wasn't some king, earthly king that is going to come in here and sit down on the throne and majestically rule for the rest of time. That's what the Jews were looking for, though, wasn't it? That's why they didn't understand who the Son of Man was back in our text. Turn over to chapter 9 of Matthew, verses 2 through 6 here. We studied this in Mark and back in uh, Adam's class not too long ago. And it, Verse 2 says, And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, laying on a bed. Jesus, seeing their face, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then he saith to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And the Son of Man had the power to heal, but he had even more so the power to forgive sins. Well, they said, Well, how can he forgive sins? He's just a man. They had the wrong viewpoint of the Son of Man, didn't they? Certainly it's easier from an outward perspective to say that sins be forgiven me. But really from an actual effective standpoint, it's a lot harder to say that sins be forgiven you. It's only God can do that. Yeah. But I could tell Adam that his sins are forgiven, but it really doesn't matter what I say, it doesn't. That's the problem with the, the Roman Catholic confessionals. Mm. Man cannot forgive man of a sin as far as for him and God. I can give, forgive Brother Junior if he wrongs me, but I can't forgive him if he sins against God. Right. But oh, the Son of Man, he had power to forgive sins. He had power to save the lame man, rise and walk. But he also had power to say that sins be forgiven me. He also had power to say, Neither do I condemn thee go and sin no more to the woman caught in adultery. Go over to chapter 12 if you will to Matthew, verse number 8. It was a, it's 
think it was the Pharisees here were complaining about Christ and his disciples eating ears of corn on the Sabbath day, plucking it from the field. And he explained to them how that really that was allowed for in the law, how that David went even and ate the shoe bread, which was in the temple or in the temple. In verse 8 he says, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Yeah. The Son of Man, he was the Lord of all, including the Sabbath day. The Jews had a problem with elevating the Sabbath day almost to a idolatry point. But Christ, he was Lord even of that, wasn't he? So he's Lord of the Monday through Sunday, even though most people today will only give him one day a week. Let's turn over to chapter, or we'll stay in chapter 12, look at verse 40. Well, they, the Pharisees and the scribes, they said they wanted a sign from him in verse 38. So, verse 39, he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given them but the sign of the prophet of Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. For Christ was to be buried three days and three nights. Mm -hmm. But then he was to rise again, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. well, they, the Jews always wanted a sign. They, Paul even tells us that they seek after a sign. Really, that's what the flesh usually wants, is something tangible, something they can see. But what does the Bible tell us? The just shall live by faith. He says the only sign I'll be giving you is the sign of Jonas or Jonah. We know that Jonah was in the well belly or the great fish, if you want to call it. Three days and three nights. So Christ was three days and three nights in the earth. He would be lifted up as we saw. He would be buried. And three days later he would rise again. See, the Son of Man was not just a mere wicked man that would die and be buried and forgotten about eventually. Oh, but our Christ, he is the one who is alive forevermore, as we saw in Revelation. He is the son of the living God. Oh, Muhammad's in a grave, Buddha's in a grave, all these others, Gandhi, all these other philosophers, all these great men, quote unquote, of the world, are in a grave somewhere. I'm sure all turn back to dust by now. Yet our God, our Christ, our Savior, our the Son of Man, as we call here. Yes, he was buried, yes, he died, but yet three days later he rose again to defeat death for us. Yeah. Let's go over to chapter 16. Matthew 16, verse 27. It says the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall have, or he shall reward every man according to his works. But Christ is coming again. The Son of Man is coming again, he says, in the glory of his Father with his angels. And he says he shall give every man according to his works. The Bible tells us that Christ will judge when he returns. Matthew 24 44 and Matthew 25, 13, paraphrasing a little bit, tell us that in an hour you think not the Son of Man cometh. Be ye therefore ready, for you know not when the Son of Man cometh. Yeah. Christ is coming again. The Son of Man here, he will return one day. He will return in full glory at that time. He says he shall judge, or here he says he shall reward every man according to his works. And John. Five, he tells us that he shall judge men, or shall judge the world. We'll go over there in a moment, but let's go to Matthew chapter 18. We can be sure that Christ is coming again, and he shall reward us according to our works, but he'll reward the wicked according to their works too. The problem is their reward is the hypocrite's reward. It's not, not a good reward. Matthew 18, verse 11. It says, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Or as Luke's Gospel says, He's come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, the Son of Man, that was 
If I could say his whole mission to come into this earth was to save that which was lost. Certainly he, he accomplished a lot in his time here. His three and a half years of ministry and his 30, three and a half years of life, as we say, but he certainly accomplished his main goal to save that which was lost. What did it say? I think it was the angel to Mary, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Well, he didn't fail at that, did he? He's not a son supposed and just hoping maybe that you'll let him save you. No, Christ saves those which he came to save. At least, really all of his were secure in the cross already. It's in time we see it come to pass. In time, Brother Jimmy will say, in time, the Lord save me and every last one of us in here. But really, when he died on the cross, we were as good as saved already, weren't we? Mm -hmm. If you really want to get technical, we, when God decreed in the eternity past, we were as good as already saved. Romans 8 tells us that we're as good as already glorified. Christ cannot fail at his mission because if the Son of Man will save that which was lost. If he doesn't save his people, if he doesn't save that which was lost, then he has been defeated, hasn't he? Oh, the Son of Man shall never be defeated. I think Satan must have thought he would defeated him there on the cross, but he got a surprise three days later, didn't he? Let's go over to Matthew chapter 20. This kind of goes along with our text here, Matthew 20 and verse 18. It says, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. Verse 19 says, And they shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and discourage and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. This is really the whole thing we've been talking about. He'll be betrayed, it says. He'll be arrested. He'll be condemned to die. He'll be, as I said here, mocked and scourged. He'll be beaten, if you will, made fun of, and then crucified, put to death. But the story isn't in there. That on the third day, he shall rise again. <clears throat> People today don't seem to want to talk about that aspect of Christ, but yet that's the most important part, isn't it? That he was arrested, that he was beaten, that he was crucified, that he was buried and rose again the third day. That is the son of man that we're talking about here. Over in Matthew 26, after he is risen, we see his position now, Matthew 26 and verse 64. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, and here uh, they had said, see, the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, tell, thou tell us whether thou be Christ, the Son of God. And he answered, and thou hast said, Thou, you said it, basically, what he said. Certainly, he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. After he was, after he rose again and appeared unto, what was the 540 days later, he ascended into heaven to sit on the right hand of God. Stephen corroborates this, if you will, in Acts chapter 7. He said he saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Let's turn over there for just a moment. Acts 7, verse 55 and 56. As Stephen was being thrown out of the city and stoned, Verse 55 says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And Christ, the Son of Man, Jesus, 
He's on the right hand of God. He's there making intercession for you and for I, even today. I don't know if he stands every time one of his comes home, but he certainly did for Stephen. Yeah. I'd say he at least does for those who are faithful to him. But he's there on the right hand of God. He's not still in the tomb. He's not walking around as a ghost somewhere. No, he's on his throne even today. Yeah. Let's go over to Luke chapter well, John chapter 3. Let's... Brother Adam had mentioned this, I believe, in one of his classes here in the last couple of weeks. And in verse 13, he says that no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. The Christ, the Son of Man, he didn't begin at the womb in Mary, did he? Certainly in a, a fleshly body he was conceived there, but the Son of Man was everlasting. He was up in heaven before. He, as it says here, came down from heaven. To think that God himself would come down to this wicked place, almost an unbelievable thought for us that have been born again. You know, he didn't, quote unquote, have to, if you will. Certainly he had to, because he said he would. But God, if he had so pleased, could have destroyed us all. You know, even all the way back to Noah, he could have wiped it all out and said, well, I'm through with this. But yet, the Son of Man, as he's called here, God himself comes down from heaven to die for you and for I. To give his life for his people. No man has ascended up to heaven. You know, they tried to build that tower up to heaven back in Genesis, didn't they? They weren't very successful, though, were they? It shows the, the stupidity, if you will, of man, though, that they think they could build a tower unto heaven. If they think they could somehow reach God by their own works. That's really what it was. Mm -hmm. But no man will ever reach God, will ever see the kingdom of God, will, will ever be in the presence of God because of his own doing. But no, what the Son of Man has done for us, that's the only way to be right with God. The only way to one day go to heaven, if you will, the only, day, only way to be saved is by the work of the Son of Man. Let's go over to chapter 8 of John. John 8, 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Here he says, When I'm lifted up, when he's crucified, you shall know that I am he. And what was it the the Roman soldier said, surely this was the Son of God. But he says, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Here he indirectly declares himself to be the Son of God as well as the Son of Man. It's, he was sent from God. As it says here, I, I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. He that hath sent me, verse 29, is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. Christ was perfectly pleasing to God in every way. And yet, how so often we fail the mark, don't we? The Son of Man truly was the Christ. He truly was the one that saved sinners from sin. He truly is the one who was pleasing to God. And it's only through him that we can please God. Only through faith in him that we can please God. 
Nope. Just for quick reference, back in chapter 5, verse 25 says, Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they shall, the here shall live. So here he declares himself to be the Son of God. In verse 26, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son of or to the Son to have life in himself. And hath given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. And here he declared himself both to be the Son of God and the Son of Man, but he says that it's coming when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. It's coming when the dead shall come forth from the graves, if you will. Revelation tells us that the grave shall give up the dead that which is in it, the sea shall give up the dead which is in it, hell shall give up the dead which is in it, and all shall stand before God. And he says here, and speaking, Father hath given him, verse 27, authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. I don't think I have all the judgment figured out exactly how they're going to go, but the Son of Man is going to execute judgment when he comes back. You know, we'll stand before him and give an account for what we've done in this life. The unsaved shall stand before him and be condemned, both by their works and by their not being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want us to consider one more point real quick before we close. Matthew chapter 16. scripture that got me thinking upon this topic, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 17. I'm sure we've all heard of it before. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And he said, who, who do people say that I am? But verse 14, they answer him, and it says, And they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, and or one of the prophets. And they say, well, he's, you're a prophet, what they said. And it wasn't a bad thing to be a prophet, but Christ was a lot more than a prophet, wasn't he? You know, John was a prophet. Elias was a prophet, or Elijah. Jeremiah was a prophet. And certainly they had the words of God as God gave it to them. And certainly, in a sense, Christ was the prophet in that he gave the message of God to the people. But yet, he was so much more than just the prophet. He was so much more than just you know, a good person with good advice. That's the way many people look at him today. He had some good things to say, but they really don't care about the rest of the stuff. Treat others how you, you want to be treated. They don't mind that part. You know, love others. They don't mind that part too much. But when he says, repent, for you shall likewise perish, they don't care for this. Right. When they say, you shall die in your sins, they don't like that too much. You know, they don't mind the, if I could say, the philosophical side of Christ, but they don't like the Son of God side of Christ, the Christ part of Christ, if you will. Who do men today say that he is? They don't understand who Christ really is, do they? Right. Verse 15, he turns to his disciples and says, He saith unto them, Whom say ye that I am? That's a really a good question even for us today. Man. Who do we say that Christ is? Yeah. And Simon answered, verse 16, or Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yeah. There's really no other way to view him than that. Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah, the Savior. Verse 17 says, And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. The flesh cannot understand that, can The flesh really doesn't want to understand that either. No, it must be revealed in the Spirit. You know, mentally, logically, 
physically we can read about Christ, we can know of the historical Jesus, if you will. But if we don't understand that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, then it really doesn't matter what we think of him, does it? It doesn't really matter if we say that he is the Son of God, if we don't really believe that he is the Son of God. There's many today that say, yeah, I'm saved, yeah. I quote unquote accepted Christ as my Savior. But even in that saying, they don't really understand who Christ is, do they? I want to, I'm going to turn to a couple more places in John real quick. If you want to follow along, I'm going to go to John chapter 6. On this thinking of who is Christ to you. John 6, verse 41. Here Christ had said that he was, he would come down from heaven. He was the bread of life. Verse 37, he said, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him come to me. I will no wise cast out. In verse 41, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which cometh down from heaven. And they were saying, well, who, who is this fellow? Saying he came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I came down from heaven? They only understood him in a physical aspect in you know, they, they really didn't understand him even in that because they said, isn't he the son of Joseph? Yes, he was under, he lived in the house of Joseph. Yes, he was his son in a sense. But he was not the physical son of Joseph, was he? Yes, Mary bore him in the womb and carried him and nursed him, no doubt, and cared for him, but she was not the mother of God, as the Catholics teach. This is how many today view him, though, just as some man that lived, some man that, like I said, had some good ideas, gave some good advice, if you will. They don't view him as the one who came down from heaven. Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Well, if he knew his father, his father is God, isn't it? He came down from his father to this wicked world. That alone was a thought we could ponder on for quite a while, that he came to this wicked earth for us. Let's turn over to chapter 18. Here we're at the arrest and crucifixion. At the end of chapter 18, verse 39, Pilate is speaking, he says, But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Plea therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews. Speaking of Christ, then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. We'll go ahead and turn over to chapter 19, <laughs> on down to verse 14 and 15. It says, and It was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith, Pilate, that is, unto the Jews, Behold, your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? Chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Isn't that the view of most of the day? As Christ himself said in another place, we will not have this man to rule over us. Yeah. They don't want Christ as king today. Very few of you that profess to be Christians want Christ as king. Yeah. They want him to save them from hell, but they don't want him to actually be the savior of their life, if you will. They would rather have Barabbas. Maybe not in a literal sense, but in a figurative sense, they'd rather have someone else. Really, any time we were, the sinner rejects Christ, they were saying, I'd rather have something else. Yeah. Just as the Jews said, well, it was Barabbas instead. He was valued less than even a, a thief and a robber. And they said, we have no king but Caesar. What a poor state to be in, had no king but Caesar. Caesar let you down pretty quickly. You know, I, I definitely don't agree with all that Trump says, but he is our president. But don't put too much stock in him, he can let you down, or he's just a man. But even if we elected a, 
a great Christian man, he would still let you down just as easy. I think our vice president is, he seems to be born again. He certainly holds a good Christian values. Yet put no confidence in man, the scripture says. To the Jews, they should have said that we have Jehovah as king at least. But even they denied that. They didn't want a king, a, a spiritual king, if you will. They wanted an earthly king. People don't want spiritual a spiritual king today. They want a spiritual Lord that tells them how they ought to live. But they don't mind earthly kings that tell them what they have to do. Well, no one, no one in the flesh really wants Christ as king. Oh, but for us that have been born again, how that he is the king of kings, the lord of lords, how he ought to be very precious to us. I want to turn one more place and I'm closing. Acts 9, verse 5. Again, a familiar passage. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus, or Paul, we call him. Verse 4. He had fell of the earth and heard the voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? In verse 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So the pricks are kind of like when you take a spurs and spur a horse, or you take a, prong, a prong, if you will, and prong the cattle to go along. And that's what the kicks were here. He said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Maybe you're one who is kicking against the pricks today as Paul was. Maybe you're one who's fighting, if you will, the leading of the Lord, he will, you can resist for a little while, but you can't ultimately resist, can you? I remember back at my own salvation, throughout the whole service, I was kicking against the pricks, if you will. The Lord didn't let me leave the building before I was submitted to him, before he said, before I cried out to him, Lord, save me. Yeah. So if you're one that's kicking against the pricks, you need to simply do as Saul said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? There's really no other answer than when the Holy Spirit is working on you to say, Lord, what will you have me to do? When the Holy Spirit works on <coughs> the Holy Spirit's working on you, you'll know. It won't be that you just decide one day that oh, I think I'll start serving God or I'll start being a Christian or I'll I'll be a good person now. I'll try a little harder. No. When the Holy Spirit convicts you, it overcomes you, doesn't it? And it's hard to kick against those pricks. Yeah. That inward drawing, if you will, that dragging, literally dragging us to Christ, and you won't be able to resist that for very long. So if you're not saved here today, I'd say turn to Christ. Turn to the Son of Man. He's the only one that can save you. Do you want to come to us in a song? Mm -hmm.